book of Psalms. Psalm 146 begins with these words. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 147. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto God, for it is pleasant. Praise is beautiful. Psalm 148. Praise ye the Lord. Praise you the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise you him, all his angels. Praise you him, all his host. Praise you him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of night. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters that be above the heavens. Praise, 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 praise. Praise the Lord. Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and praise in the congregation of saints. Psalm 150. Praise you the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Uh, we Baptists haven't read that, have we? Uh, praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Now, isn't that a good place to start? As we come gathering together uh, to ask the Lord's blessing, as we gather ourselves together on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, that's a good place to start. And Brother Rick has already led us in singing what we call the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This song, the doxology, is actually the final stanza of a much longer song. As a matter of fact, Thomas Ken wrote these words at somewhere around 1674. So for 350 years, the church has been singing these four lines of what we call the doxology. And so 350 years ago, he wrote a hymn that had 13 verses, maybe even 14 verses. And when we sing the doxology, we're only singing this final stanza of a 14 stanza song. Now, wouldn't that be something? To sing 14, some of you would think, well, that's contemporary worship. We're just saying it over and over and over again. So you say, well, that would be, okay, so that's fine. But no, what he's saying is he got up in the morning and he called this a morning hymn. And so when you got up every morning, you sang these 14 verses, not to yourself, you sang them to the Lord. And then he wrote an evening hymn. And then I guess he wrote a midday hymn. And every, all three of those hymns that he wrote ended with the very same stanza. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above you heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the church has been singing it ever since. When I grew up out there in that little country church in Kentucky, we sang the doxology. You cross denominational lines, you sing the doxology. You cross racial lines, you sing the doxology. You cross language lines, and you'll find yourself in Europe or South America or in Central America. And you know what you find? You find them lifting up the Lord by singing the words to the doxology. The word doxology itself is interesting. The word doxa, the first part of it, is the word for glory. And actually, three words, glory or splendor or grandeur. And then logos is the word for word or for speaking. And so when you put the two words together, doxa and logos, you blend them together and you get doxology. And this is what it means. The meaning of the two words is literally that we're speaking of the splendor of our God. Is that not what David did in Psalm 146 to Psalm 150? The Bible tells me that the heavens declare the glory of God. They certainly did this past week. I know I went out and I looked at that full moon, supposed to be the biggest moon in the last 
uh, seven decades, I think, in 70 years, and it's going to be a long time. I'll be in heaven if the Lord tarries. Uh, uh, this earth still goes on. These heavens continue to exist. I'll be gone by the time it's a moon that big. And I looked at it, and I thought, it's a big moon. Um, uh, I've seen big moons before. It's a big moon. But then I look at the heavens, and the Bible says they declare the glory of God. Have you ever thought about that? Just walked out. And uh, you want to see the heavens, you really want to see the heavens when there is the dark of the moon, not the light of the moon. And you walk out, you look past our galaxy, and you look further out into outer space, and it goes on and on and on. Who can count the stars? We have no idea how many stars there are, but we know this according to God's Word, that God made every one of them, and He hung them in place. And the heavens declare the glory of God. In this wonderful, beautiful earth that God has made that is supposed to have deer on it somewhere out there, <laughs> uh, they declare the glory of God. Uh, I haven't seen them, but I'm assuming they're there somewhere. And God made everything, and it was good. So this morning, we think about why we come to church. And some of you are probably saying, good question. I've wondered that many times, Brother Monty. Uh, why do we even come to church? And sometimes, uh, sometimes it's hard to cut through all the distractions of uh, looking things over and counting lights that are out and um, looking around us at the people that are around us, and the new colors of hair, the New hair, maybe, maybe not. People that are around us, there's a lot of things. And bless their hearts, these little kids that come to church and they sit in seats where their feet don't touch the floor and they've had to have their ears scrubbed the night before. And, and uh, you know, you come to church and there's been a big war. First of all, you've come to church out of a war zone it's called the family car on the way to church and so there's been a struggle all the way here and you come and you come in and you say okay so I'm here for a number of different reasons maybe I've come to be edified that's a big word or maybe I've come to be enlightened or I'm going to see some old friends today and I'm going to hear a lesson and we're going to sing some and we're going to pray some and we're going to hear some preaching and we're going to give some we're going to take an offering there'll be an invitation why do you come to church? Well, I come to church because mom and dad always went to church. Grandma and grandpa always went to church. Great grandma, grandma, grandpa went to church. My friends are gathered here. I come to church for all different kinds of reasons. And yet, God's word says there is a central reason why we've even gathered together this morning. And that is we've come together to worship, to worship, to worship God. Now, I don't think, I think it's a rare thing that we consciously get up on a Sunday morning and say, today I am going to worship God. I know this for me. I'm thinking about what we're going to sing. I'm thinking about what, what I'm going to preach. I'm looking that message over. I'm thinking about who will be here, who might need to hear this word. And so that's all in my mind. But, but how rare it is for me to come through the doors of a church house and think today I am coming to worship God. What would change in our lives if instead of saying to people, why don't you come to church with me? We said, why don't you come worship with me? Because the purpose of our being here today is not to come to church. The purpose of our being here today is to worship God. To come back to the heart of worship, as one modern songwriter wrote. And to understand that it is not all about us, it's all about Him. But my purpose in being here, our purpose today, I've come together for this reason. I've come to worship God and His Son, Jesus Christ. I am come. Think about this. That's hard to get all the clutter out of our minds and just shove it out of the way. But to think that my purpose in being here today is not to hear the sermon. And, and, and if I'm thinking that, then I'm probably overexalting the sermon. But my purpose to be here today is not to hear the sermon. My purpose to be here today is I've come for one reason. With my heart and everything that's in me, I have come to worship God. And I can do that in a deer stand 
Oh, I've heard that excuse. Or I can do that on a boat, or I can do that at home. I can do that, but God commands us to come together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We are to come together together in a group to worship Him. We are to praise God. God inhabits the praises of His people. And more than that, I look here, it says, praise ye, you praise. This comes as a command. You praise the Lord. You praise God from whom all blessings flow. God inhabits the praises of his people. I think a lost person has a reason to praise God, don't you? And so a person that doesn't know Christ, they have a reason to praise God. Their heart is beating. They can take a deep breath. There's food on their table. They have a family around them. They have a reason to praise God. They live in this country with all the freedoms they enjoy. They have a reason to praise God. I think a lost person can do that, that he can praise God. I think a person that, I, I must feel sorry for that person that doesn't believe in God at all. Well, I must tell you, dear friend, that God has been good to you anyway. You may not believe in him, but he's been good to you anyway. In fact, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. And to that person that wants to argue the existence of God, then it simply treasures up unto itself wrath until the day of wrath. I'm telling you, we are a blessed people. I was with Larry Mary the other day friend of his from Mexico, Paul Gonzalez, was in town, and I sat down with Brother Paul and just, talk, just, just to hear his heart for his people in Mexico, and he was talking about how that the church he has is just next to the dump, the city dump, and the ministry that he has is to people that live in and off of the city dump. I first was made aware of that type of thing when we were in Romania years ago, and I saw, I saw little huts and things that were actually constructed at the dump. The idea of us here, we, we Americans, moving out east of town and moving into the dump that's out there and say, that's where I live. I mean, that's foreign to our thoughts, and yet to realize this morning there are people around us, around our, in our world, that are living in the dump. Living off the dump, his church ministers to people there. He says we minister to the least of the least. And he's got a friend who ministers to the least of least in India, and his friend said to him, well, at least you have a dump. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Every believer ought to know this song. And I must say, it troubled me a few weeks ago when we, we observed the Lord's Supper and we finished by singing the doxology. And I started out the aisle, and I noticed there were a lot of people at Concord that were not singing the doxology. And you say, well, I don't know this. Well, let me tell you, this is something you need to learn then. You need to know John 3.16, right? Right? I think probably most all of us could quote John 3.16. You need to know that Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I think everybody probably, only maybe most of us at least, 90% uh, of us know Jesus loves me. This I know. You ought to know amazing grace. That ought to be a part of what is in your knowledge so that when we begin to sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound of saved a wretch like me, you know at least the first, all in America, know at least the first verse of amazing grace. But every true believer ought to be able able to sing from the bottom of our heart. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You praise God. Now, here's my first point. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I had to praise him for his mighty acts. 
Psalm 150 verse 2 says, Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. James, writing in chapter 1, James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Every good, perfect thing we have comes from God. Can we just say that? What do you have that you did not receive? He is the source of every blessing. There's always the possibility that we will forget that he is the source of every blessing. God warned the children of Israel through Moses as they were on their way out of Egypt, as they were about to go in the promised land, he gave him these words in the book of Deuteronomy, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he gave unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, Vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. I would tell you the greatest danger in the United States today is that we would forget the Lord our God. I mean, he's good to us. He's blessed us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. He's the source of every blessing we have. And I think President Lincoln, back in 1863, I mean, this man was a great orator and uh, uh, at least a, a man of incredible wisdom and insight. And so we know that 153 years ago yesterday, I, I'm sure you know this is impressed on your mind, that he stood at Gettysburg and gave a Gettysburg address that we used to have to memorize. And so 153 years ago yesterday, November the 19th, was the Gettysburg address. But before that, in October, he issued a Thanksgiving decree to all of the United States, to those who were striving to hold the union together. And this is what he said. He said, we've been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. That's what President Lincoln said. He said, we have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us and have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own, intoxicated with unbroken success, we become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. And 153 years later, he had just described the nation we're living in today. Intoxicated with our success, drunk on success, forgetting the God that has blessed us so much. In our vanity, we've seemed to think that who we are is that we have made ourselves, not understanding that it is God who made us and not we ourselves. You don't have a thing in your house that hasn't proceeded from the Lord. Every blessing you have has come from the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 for just a moment. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Now, he is above all creatures here below. Jesus Christ is above all. We can say that there's not anything in this universe that he is below. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Every being in all of the universe is below the one that has so graciously poured out blessings upon us. Who would not want to praise a Savior like Jesus? Who would not want to have a God like that? One that we could turn to in the deepest, darkest periods of our life when we don't know what's going on, where we're headed. We don't know what's going to, bring, uh, come, going to come our way over the next year. We have no idea what may be headed our way. And yet we have a God who loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to be our Savior. He, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He came down in the form of sinful flesh, died on the cross for our sins, was put in a buried tomb. He didn't even own the own tomb. His own tomb he was buried in, but as somebody said, he didn't need to own it. He just needed to borrow it. And so they put him in a tomb. But three days later, up from the grave he arose so that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Now, how much, how, how every is every? I mean, it's every. It's like asking how all is all. All is always all. Every is always every. So you say, well, I got a tongue. Uh, you got a tongue. All God's children got a tongue. I got a knee. You got a knee. All God's children got a knee. So when it says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, then it must mean all human beings. Absolutely. It does mean that. But I think it even extends beyond human beings. I think that when it says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, then let's just go a little further. I think the animal kingdom yields to God the Father, the one who created them, the one who made them. The animal kingdom yields to them. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, then you just explain to me how a donkey is going to stop a false prophet named Balaam. His donkey is going to turn and talk to him. Why? Because God says, you going to turn, you say, well, I've never heard donkey talk before. Don't be so sure about that. Be careful. How about that fish that went and climbed into the net? When Jesus said, cast your net on the other side, how about that fish with a coin in his mouth? And Jesus said, it's time for you to show up. You've had that coin for a while. It's time to spit it out. What about that whale, Brother John, that swallowed Jonah? That great fish that God had prepared. He sure was glad to get that backslidden Baptist preacher out of his mouth, threw him up on the bank. You begin to look at everything in the animal kingdom that gave praise to the Lord, just did obedience to the Lord all through their lives, all through the life of Jesus, and printed, pointed out in God's Word. And I will tell you today that the entire animal kingdom, every tongue will confess. They don't have to be converted. They don't have to repent of their sin, but every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here, listen to me now. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below, but then praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Turn on over to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. John on the Isle of Patmos is taken into the presence of the Lord, caught up. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet calling, Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So he's caught in the presence of the Lord. And this is what he sees in verse 4. Around about the throne where there were 24 seats, and upon the seats I saw 24 elders seated, clothed in white raiment. They had on their head crowns of gold. Down in verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne was four beasts full of eyes before and behind, these living creatures. Verse 8, and four beasts, they, each of them had six wings about him. What, a, what an amazing description. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Verse 10, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him and living forever and liveth forever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. 
I get to Revelation chapter 5. And it says in verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Then down in verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts and the, said, Amen. And the, four, and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever ever and ever. This is a picture of what we see in heaven. Now, I've heard some folks say that this is what we're going to be doing throughout all eternity in heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that we're going to be doing this through all eternity in heaven, but what it does point us toward is that everything we're going to be doing in heaven is going to be to the praise, the glory, and the honor of the Lamb that is on the throne. I don't know all that God has planned for us. I know this much. We're never going to be bored in heaven. There's nobody that's going to say, oh, my goodness, we got to go up to worship here in a few minutes. Time shall be no more. You won't need a watch in heaven. You won't need a cell phone in heaven, praise the Lord. Uh, You won't need to be entertained in heaven. Your mind is about to be blown when we get to heaven because this is what we're going to find. Praise him above ye heavenly host. What an awesome picture of praise we have in God's word. If you don't want to praise the Lord, if you say, well, I get to heaven, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to praise the Lord. Let me remind you of somebody that said the very same thing. His name was Lucifer, and he's not going to be in heaven. He's been kicked out because he wanted to worship himself more than he did the Lord. So praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts, and then praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It has been said that more people have learned the doxology, that have learned about the Trinity from singing the doxology than they have in all the theological classes that have ever been held. Praise Father, Son, Holy Ghost. This is a great mystery. When, uh, when we begin first Sunday in December to talk about the coming of the Messiah in this world, we're going to talk about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And I must tell you, write the word mystery over it because the incarnation of God becoming man, it's a mysterious event. Creation was a mystery But our redemption is a mystery. And what God has for us in eternity is a mystery. One of the biggest mysteries of all is how we have a Father, we have a Son, we have a Holy Spirit. They are all God, and yet they're all one God. They're three distinct persons, yet they are one, three in one, one in three. We call this the doctrine of the Trinity. And a lot of times, if we're having an examination of a deacon or a pastor or whatever, I like to ask the question, can you explain the doctrine of the Trinity in 30 seconds so everybody can understand it? Well, I've been preaching for 43 years, and I can't explain it like that. I can state the principle behind it, but to say that I must understand the mystery behind it, I can't do it. But if I could understand God, he wouldn't be God. He's beyond all of that. God the Father did not cease to be the Father when he sent the Son. The same Holy Spirit who hovered over the face of the deep of creation rested on the Son at baptism. And this very same Holy Spirit baptized the church on the day of Pentecost. He superintended over every word of the revelation that we have. And he today, this day, the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. He walks down every hospital corridor. He stands by every graveside. He comforts every family. He gives us strength when we're going through the toughest time in our lives. Let me tell you something. Do you need a father? Yes, you need a father. Uh, people talk about, well, you know, I didn't have such a good father. My, my dad was not a good dad. And maybe some of us might even feel we haven't been the best of dads, but I'll tell you something, I can point you to a father that is above every father you could ever possibly imagine. He is a good, good father. Yes, he is. Do I need the Holy Spirit? 
you better believe I need the Holy Spirit. I need that comforter in my life to strengthen me and stand alongside of me. Of course I do. I need the Holy Spirit, and I need God the Father. And oh, listen, God knew that I really needed a Savior. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of every lost human being, every man, woman, boy, and girl who would call upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says in the book of Colossians that in him, in Jesus, dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we're saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all wrapped up in Jesus. No wonder the hymn writer wrote, No mortal can with him compare among the sons of men. Fairer is he than all the fair who fill the heavenly train. There's no word in the human tongue that could ever fully explain how wonderful our Lord Jesus is. Praise him. Praise God. Praise his son, Jesus Christ. When I think about my great God, I just want to praise him. I want my life to be a life of worship and praise and adoration of the Lord. And it begins, as Paul writing in the book of Romans said, that you present your lives a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. He's calling you to worship Him, to praise Him. It begins... When we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior for the forgiveness of sin, and I have to ask you, have you done that? Have you come to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, the very Jesus who went to the cross and died on the cross that you might have eternal life and rose from the dead? Praise Him. You begin to praise Him by giving your heart to Him. Sing this little word with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Stand with me this morning. Heavenly Father, there is no God like you, and you are good. And every good and every perfect gift comes down from you. You are faithful. There is no shadow of turning. What a wonderful, wonderful God you are. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be forgiven of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. We are so unworthy. We are such sinners. And you loved us. And you gave your own life. You shed your own blood on the cross of Calvary that we might be saved. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking by us and living in us every single day. And that when we mess up, you pick us up. When we sin, you convict us that we will go running home. And there's not much more we can say other than just praise you because you are worthy of praise. No mortal can compare with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we give thanks this morning. Now, O God... Would the peace that passes all understanding dwell richly in our hearts in this Thanksgiving season. And may we follow and obey you every day.